Hello everybody, this is Jonathan Jones. You can visit me at jonathanjones.tv or you may be already there. That may have been how you found um, this uh, recording. I am uh, going to start uh, posting some blogs and some writings, articles, messages, that type of thing. Uh, I'm going to try to do it once a week. Um, it may not work out all the time, uh, but that's certainly what I'm going to try to do. Uh, and, and the entire purpose is to um, talk about uh, re real, really anything, but various issues, cultural issues, um, theological issues, political issues. Um, but seeing it through the lens of a worshiper of Christ, my primary ministry is worship. And I sort of operate out of a passion for worship and uh, missions. And I believe the two are uh, directly connected, cannot be broken. Um, and in fact, I think worship is the primary goal of the church. There are those that would disagree with me on that. Um, and I don't know why, because when you reason it out, the reason that, we're, that missions and evangelism exists is because worship does not. We want to bring everyone to a place of worship, of true worship of the living God. And so I'm going to talk about various issues and uh, how we are to uh, live our lives in light of being worshipers of Jesus Christ. And so um, something that's been on my heart today, um, really specifically unity in the church. Uh, it's, it's a topic that we talk about a lot, and perhaps uh, we talk about it more than we live it out. And specifically, I want to talk about unity in the church in, the, in a divisive uh, society. Um, our society appears to be increasingly divisive and, and discriminatory against the church, and we really shouldn't be surprised by this. Jesus told us in John 16, 33, uh, that in this world we're going to have trouble. It's a guarantee. And so, um, you know, we are in a battle waged between flesh and spirit in this society. And so how do we as the church respond to that? You can name the issue. You turn on the news, um, there are going to be issues that people are divided over, particularly in our country, and it seems to be getting worse and worse. As worshipers of the living God, how are we as the church to respond to it? How are we to live in unity as we're called to do in Romans 12, 8, uh, 12 18? Um, our culture is divisive, but we have been placed here for such a, such a time as this, and we are to live in harmony with each other as the church. If the church is not unified, certainly the world will not be unified. Um, and, and when you think of the issues out there, there's, it's not just that there's a bipolarity of views. In other words, there's not just two different views, but there, are, uh, a, there is a plurality of cultural views. So when you talk about difficult subjects like sexuality or war or music or film or racism, there, is a, there are a lot of views, not only on those issues, but how to handle um, the, those issues. Um, you know, what, what is the Christian stance on war? Is there a Christian stance on war? Um, these are some issues that we have to grapple with as Christians and at, 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 as the church. And it is um, not just likely, but it is, it is evident, even in the church, that there are varying views on how to handle these issues. Uh, so how are we to live in unity with people having so many different views on so many different things, even in the church? Uh, to some who profess Christ as Lord, unity may mean giving in to the demands of a sinful world. We see that more and more. Churches are abandoning the biblical teachings of the faith. Um, to others, it may mean condemning the world, condemning those who believe differently and and. That obviously is not the correct way to go either. And to others, often there seems to be a link between political alignment and faith. Uh, during the last election, I heard on both sides, how can you be a Christian and vote for Donald Trump? How can you be a Christian and vote for Hillary Clinton? And it just baffled me that people would somehow associate a political party or candidate with their faith. And it is incredibly wrong. 
So there's division, not only in the world, but even in the church. And no matter how good the intentions are, most of these are flawed. And the Christian faith is never to be married to one political idea. Uh, Tertullian, I'm writing my doctoral thesis right now, and um, I'm finishing up, actually. Hopefully I will be finished in the next uh, few months. Uh, Tertullian is one of the church figures that I am utilizing uh, he would suggest that the unity of the church is a perpetual fact and that our task is not to create it, but to exhibit it. And so how are we as the unified church, if we are already unified, how are we to live in the, the reality of unity uh, in a constantly divisive world that is pulling us in every direction? Where is the church to draw the line between the foundations of the Christian faith and those things that cause dissent that maybe we should separate from. Where do we draw the line on that? Um, we are going to share disparate approaches as Christians to different issues. It, it is, uh, we are hu human and we are different, uh, but that's not a bad thing. It exemplifies a diverse church, but we still need to be unified on the foundation of Jesus Christ. We need to live in harmony and the mistake that we often make is a feeble attempt to universalize personal convictions. Um, I can give you an example. There are many people that will tell um, uh, people that it is wrong to drink, that drinking alcohol is wrong. And we cannot say that universally it is wrong or it's a sin to drink alcohol when that is not explicitly stated in Scripture. If you have a personal conviction with that, so be it. Make it a personal conviction, but don't try to universalize it. And so uh, I want to suggest some ways that the church should live in unity despite a confused world, which in many ways is also confusing the church. So uh, first of all, the church as believers, we need to live in agreement on foundational issues. Um, foundational itch issues are those that are not optional. Um, we cannot live in the reality of unity if we do not agree on foundational issues. So what constitutes a foundational issue? I want to give you uh, answer that in two ways. There is the explicitness of Scripture, and there is also the explicitness of church history. And uh, we might conclude, in fact, I would conclude that Scripture holds more weight than church history uh, but church history, nonetheless, is a, it's a crucial factor to examine. We have to look at church history and what the church fathers and the churches throughout the centuries have said about various issues. Um, foundational issues are those that are not, uh, that, that they are, uh, they're overtly present in the text of the Bible. In other words, they are explicit, not only in the text of Scripture, but throughout church history, and they are unambiguous. Um, we shouldn't need anything more than Scripture, but if, uh, for lack of a better term, I could say that church history really is the icing on the cake. It is, it is the um, uh, thing that drives the nail in the issue. And so it, if it has been ever present throughout history in a normalized fashion, and it is explicit in the text of Scripture, it should be considered a foundational issue. And these are typically issues that we uh, can name and, and point to without much thought. Uh, salvation through faith in Christ. The virgin birth. Uh, unfortunately, there are people now that question the virgin birth. That is not something you can question. It has everything to do not only with the deity of Christ, but the incarnation of Christ as well. And so the authority of the Bible, these are things that are non-negotiable. And we, we don't have to think about them too much because they're so woven into the fabric of our foundation of our faith. And we have to stand firm on these without wavering. They're foundational issues because they're explicit in the narrative of Scripture and in church history. One way, one thing I point to for foundational issues is the Apostles' Creed. Um, I am Protestant, and my church does not utilize the Apostles' Creed in its worship practices. However, um, I would not hesitate to say that uh, we believe everything about it. What the Apostles' Creed says is it's sort of the cliffs notes of the Bible, and we believe the foundational truths there. 
So we cannot waver on the foundational issue. Secondly, the church, we have to live in grace on subordinate issues. So if, if we have to be unwavering on the critical issues, we have to live in grace on the subordinate issues. Uh, because there's room for disagreement on those. Uh, if, if foundational issues are explicit in Scripture and church history, secondary issues are not. Uh, they are sometimes not um, very clear. They're not black and white, for lack of a better term. And often Christians make the mistake um, of presenting the appearance of explicitness on secondary issues when it really isn't there. And we could think of many issues uh, where that, that is applicable, such as baptism, communion, the doctrine of election. There are many varying views on those issues, um, which I would not be so quick to say that someone who disagrees with me on one of those issues is wrong. Um, I recently heard someone talking about the doctrine of election and said that Calvinists are wrong and uh, without realizing that I myself am a five-point Calvinist. Um, he said this, and, and I thought, I would not be so quick to say that. Um, uh, I do not believe in transubstantiation, but I have fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who do, and these are issues where there's room for disagreement, and we have to live in grace on these issues. So what constitutes a subordinate issue? Uh, it's a lack of clarity in the Bible and in, in church history. They, these are non-salvific issues. These are issues that we, we see a range of views throughout church history. Um, and the result, uh, this is the result of Scripture's opacity to these issues, to these views. And so many people don't like to think of the Bible as ambiguous, but there are paradoxes and there are areas where these issues are unclear. Um, I don't mean to say that the Bible does not talk about them, because it certainly does, but they are non-salvific issues, and there's room for theological and sometimes even political difference. Uh, for example, um, politically, um, there are those that will say that communism in and of itself is a sin, and it is wrong. Now, I personally would not adhere to communism and not say that it is uh, the best thing for a society, but Scripture does not talk about that, and we cannot throw those things in the category of explicitly wrong when they are not there. And so there's room to disagree with each other on these secondary issues. The third thing we have to do to uh, provide unity, to, to live in the reality of unity in the church, in a divisive society, is that uh, we should not expect holiness from the world. Um, we are to live in unity with each other, but how are we to live in unity in a divisive world? Well, we cannot expect holiness from people who are not made holy yet. They are not yet believers. And some of them may become believers one day, but a grave mistake the church often makes is possessing an expectation for a lost world to live a moral lifestyle. Um, if, if Christians who possess the life-changing power of the Holy Spirit continue to struggle with sin, why should we expect that those apart from Christ, uh, why should we expect them to live in holiness? I firmly believe that any, any good that comes from any human is a result of God's holiness. It's not the result of any amount of good we possess, because we don't have any good. We are naturally fallen and evil. And so living in the reality that the world is evil and is in need of a Savior... It should foster mercy from us to be given to the world, to be shown to the world. It should not be a conduit of hatred. Look at me, I'm saved, you're not, you're going to hell. We should not be that way. And certainly we should preach the truth of Scripture, but forcing morality will never work. The government can't legislate it. The church cannot hate or scare people into it. And so it's imperative that the church realizes the, the depravity of a fallen world and live... Not just in light of that, it doesn't stop there, but live in light of mercy, not hatred. The, the, the recent events in Charlottesville have caused me to uh, ponder, to think about if the church has responded correctly. And, and, and I think about this in two different ways. First, I think it's likely, and, and although it's unprovable, uh, but it is likely that many of the Charlottesville protesters are not believers. And what I mean by that, it, it is not provable. 
There are those that will say you can prove whether or not someone is a Christian. I don't necessarily believe that. Evidence is not necessarily proof. Um, so evidence uh, certainly can reveal or point to uh, the way someone is or, or maybe um, suggest that someone is a Christian. But if they say they are Christian... Um, they may be, and, and, and there are those that will say, well, look at their lifestyle. You know, they could be in a point in their life when perhaps they're living in sin, and maybe the Lord is convicting them. We don't know. Um, I've been there. Maybe you have been there where you were living in blatant disobedience, but you were a Christian. We don't know. Someone's faith is between them and God, but it is likely um, that many of the Sharpsville protesters were not believers, and I don't suggest this as a form of judgment, but scripture is clear that the gate of salvation is small and that the road is narrow. That's Matthew 7, 14. Um, is, among any group of people, there are going to be few Christians. And I would even submit that even in local churches, there might be few Christians. Now, as the church, as the true believers of Christ, we have to respond to the hateful protesters and the rhetoric of, uh, that, w- that was happening in, in Charlottesville. We have to respond in love, but at the same time condemning the act itself. And so fighting hate with hate has never worked, and it will never work. And so the church has to be unified in her stance against racism, but also respond to racists in love. You see, we can't expect holiness from those who are not Christians. Even as Christians, we fail. So why should we expect those who are apart from Christ to be perfect and live in holiness and morality that they, they, they don't possess? There's no life change from the Holy Spirit. And so for reasons of humanity's imperfection and God's grace, we have to love rather than hate. And, and so the second way I want to look at this uh, is um, from a different perspective we have the responsibility to respond in love not only to the hateful protesters in Charlottesville, uh, but also the hateful responses to them. In the wake of the events, there were political and church leaders who many with good intentions responded actually with hate. And we as a church should in no way negate the horrible reality of racism, but we should also measure our words very, very carefully. There's a thin line. There are certainly ways to stand against racism in unequivocal, unequivocal terms while, while concurrently sending a message of love to all people. And it's a fine line because to be unequivocal, and ambiguity is not an option. However, calling protesters terms such as subhuman and monsters does no good. Those are terms that I've heard in the recent weeks. In fact, it's counterproductive to the message of love, and it really sends a message of hate. And there is no, hear me out, there is no such thing as a subhuman. I hear that term often. Uh, and normally it is, is, it is used to refer to people who have done horrific things, either acts of terrorism or whatever the case is. People will refer to them as subhuman, but all People, hear me, all people are created in God's image. That even means the September 11th terrorists are not subhuman. It drives me crazy when people use that term. And there is more than enough capacity within the Lord to love and save them if he so chooses. That's why we as a church have to pray for the salvation of all. So we have a responsibility to preach a message of love, not hate. And to do this... We have to first live in the reality that the world is not holy and is actually, in fact, in direct opposition to the gospel. That is the natural state of the world. And so we have to be unified in our stance against evil, but also unified in our stance for grace. The two are compatible. Uh, The last thing we have to do to live in unity as a church in a diverse society is we have to disassociate with apostasy, and realize that this is not synonymous with, a non, with anonymity. Um, what I mean by that is uh, we have to disassociate with those who might try to harm the gospel. And there are those that exist even within the church. 
They at least profess to be a part of the church. It should already be clear that we should set ourselves apart from the world, uh, which is in no way an excuse not to befriend the world. But there are also times when the church has to disassociate fellowship with other believers. Um, I, I believe those times are when, an indiv- when individual believers and local churches continuously act in ways that are uh, contradictory to the explicit commands of Scripture. The blatant attitude is what gives the church the leverage to disassociate here, the blatant attitude of those who cause disunity. Uh, and when this attitude exists in an unrepentant fashion, the church has to disassociate fellowship. This is known as church discipline, and, and there's a biblical model to follow when employing church discipline. You can read it in Matthew 18, 18, 15 through 20. And it is, unfortunately, uh, many people do not follow that model. If you have a problem with someone, go to them first. Don't talk to others about them. Rarely is that model employed, and it should be. And it's not, er- it's not really often that the church discusses church discipline, but the Bible is clear that sometimes it is necessary to remove fellowship of apostate believers. Um, however, sometimes we make the mistake in thinking that church discipline is synonymous with anonymity. anonymity. In other words, throw the person out, have nothing to do with them, show them vast hatred, and that is not the case. When we oust an apostate believer... It does not mean hating them, but it means treating them as one who is not a believer. The insinuation then is that we love that person. How do you treat someone who is not not a believer? You love them. You pray for their salvation. You pray for restoration. The goal is restoration. The goal is for their life to be changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. So disassociation is not the same as anonymity. So for the church to be unified, we cannot at all spread a message of hate in any fashion. You see where I'm driving at here? To be unified as the church in an ever-changing and divisive and diverse society, we have to perpetuate a message of love, not of hatred. The church is perpetually unified. Tertullian had it right. And and we're, we're... Our responsibility is to claim that truth and to live in its reality. There's a spiritual war raging around us at every moment. And and in a world that tugs at us so frequently and in so many directions, the church has a responsibility to continue living in unity. Sadly, uh, there are many professing churches and Christians and believers who will become apostate. That is biblical. And we must separate ourselves from apostasy and from unorthodox teachings and and certainly heresy, but we have to also continue to live in unity as the remnant, as the the remnant church. There's a difference in the remnant and the visible church. If the visible church abandons all orthodox teachings, uh, there will still be a remnant. There will always be God's people. And My question then is, will we allow an opposing world who is diametrically against the church, whether we realize it or not, they are, will we allow an opposing world to infiltrate our sacred walls? Will we allow disunity in the church to stir tension? Or or, or will we stand firm upon the foundation of the Bible and church history? And furthermore, will we be conduits of God's mercy and grace In a disunified world, a world that is already disunified, my hope and prayer is that the latter is true, that we will be conduits of mercy and grace and unity. The issues that we face in our culture, they're magnificent, but God's mercy is far greater than any battle that humankind or Satan himself can wage. And so we need to live in the perpetual truth and reality of unity in all all facets and in all issues. So as the world rages on, as these issues continue and increase in our society and, and there will be more and more divisiveness, let the church be a conduit of unity only by the power of Holy Spirit. Thank you for listening. God bless you.